I think we'll uh, we'll start rolling here, and then if there's any more uh, people coming, we can um, let them in. I see a hand up from uh, Biana. Um, we will get to questions here in a little bit. Um, the the way this is gonna go, guys. If for those of you that haven't been a part of our our faculty corner um, series, is uh, we're gonna start with some time featuring our, our faculty member of the month, and then we'll transition over for some Q&A and uh, I will be facilitating that. Um, but before we get rolling, um, let me introduce myself. Uh, my name is Brian Deal and I work in the admissions office. And this is one of my, I don't know where he is on your screen, my, one of my associates, uh, Jordan Yo, uh, he also works in the admissions office here in Hamilton. And, um, we're going to be recording this, so if you are uh, uncomfortable with your face being on it, um, feel free to turn off your camera. That said, uh, you know we're not going to be spamming this all over the internet, so don't don't fret too much. Um, we are we are honored this evening to have a professor that uh, neither Jordan nor I ever had as a as a teacher while we were at seminary, but um, a fantastic lady. Um, and though she was never my professor, she is a dear friend, and uh, her husband and her have been key mentors throughout my uh, journey in ministry and in life for the last, what, seven years. Mm -hmm. And um, yeah, so just a real privilege to have Donna Petter on, who is uh, an Old Testament professor here at, in Hamilton, and then also heads up the Hebrew program. So uh Dr. Petter, I'm going to hand it over to you. Take us away. Okay, great. Well, it's nice to see all of you. I, I'd just love to hear where you're calling in from, if you don't mind my, my asking, because that just also helps me kind of. So I'm, I'm from uh, right now, I'm in Metro West. I'm in Sudbury, Massachusetts. So maybe you all can say where you're from. How about you, Ryan? Where are you from? I am in Orlando, Florida. Oh, Robert. Oh, you're okay. So you're the Y Whammer from Orlando. Wonderful. Great. Tim? Hi, I'm from North Carolina. Wonderful. Okay. And I see Christine, where are you from? I'm in um, Connecticut. Okay. Connecticut. Wonderful. And uh, Val, are you there, Val? I'm here. Where uh, are you? Yep. I'm actually from Texas, but I'm, I'm, I'm visiting a family friend here in Milwaukee. So currently, Milwaukee, Wisconsin. Okay, wonderful. So we got people from all over. All right, then how about Song? Sure, she's in New York. Okay, great. We got that. And then uh, is it Yared? Yared, where are you calling from? I don't think. Yared, hello? Seems like his screen might have frozen up. Yeah, oh, he's frozen. Okay. Biana, where are you call, ca calling from? Yeah. No. Claymore? Maybe they're not on the not, maybe they're not on the call yet. But anyway, it's okay. So from Zambia. Oh. Wow, isn't that wonderful? Well, my name, so I am, I've been at Gordon Conwell now for almost 15 years. And my area that I love and have passion for is the Old Testament. And uh, together with my husband, actually, we came as a team ministry to Gordon Conwell. And so it, we were, we are actually products of Gordon Conwell. I don't know if any of you had an opportunity uh, to kind of read up about us. But anyway, I am a product of Gordon Conwell. I came as a student to Gordon Conwell from the context of the missionary field. I was in youth with the mission. So I was in was youth with the mission for about eight years. And then <clears throat> we had a passion to continue on with our studies. Uh, and so Gordon Conwell was our, our school that we were very interested to, to visit. And the reason why we were interested in Gordon Conwell, and I don't know why some of you are interested, but we were interested for the very strong reputation that had in biblical studies and particularly the languages. 
And uh, we had a very strong bachelor. We had a bachelor's degree in biblical studies. And so we knew we, 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 we were, we loved the Bible, but we wanted more. And so we were drawn to Gordon Connell because of that. So it was very, very exciting. Um, and so we had a fan, just to tell you, like I had a fantastic time as a student at Gordon Connell. In fact, I couldn't get enough. I came in to do a master's of arts in new Testament and I wanted to test, share this fun story with you because it just shows how the Lord just kind of orchestrated things. Uh, my husband was in, he was doing uh, church history and then he was taking Hebrew as an elective. So he's a ch love church history, church historian, and he was taking Hebrew as an elective. And he said to me, Donna, you're in New Testament. And so you, you should be taking Hebrew as an elective. And I'm like, no, no way. And so when I looked at the Hebrew font and I looked at the characters, I was like, no, this is not for me. I can do Greek. Greek is good. I can hang out with the New Testament. Uh, but no, no, no. And as it turns out, though, he kept Tom, my husband, he kept uh, he kept saying, Donna, you really shouldn't even think of doing a New Testament. I was, in fact, a degree in New Testament without this Old Testament language as an elective. And it was just really my own Honestly, my own insecurity when I looked at the, the language that made me say, no, I wouldn't do it. But but I actually came around and I thought, he's right. You know, I really do need to be well-rounded. I should know both the old and the new. I should know both Greek and Hebrew. So, so I took the challenge and I will never forget that I sat in my very first Hebrew class and I thought, okay, so we were learning the alphabet and the vowels. And I came home that night and I will never forget. I, I sat on my bed and I said to the Lord, this is it. I want to switch to the Old Testament. And it was after one lesson, really one week, actually two full classes. Uh, but especially the first night I came back, we had rehearsed the alphabet in class. My professor, Dr. Pratico at the time uh, had given just a, a, a I don't know what it was, just a vocabulary insight, a devotion on one vocabulary word. And it was a game changer for me. And I got hooked because of that. And so I, when I came back from class, I thought, that's it. I don't just want to do Hebrew as an elective. I want to change my major. So that's what I did after my first week of taking biblical Hebrew. I actually shifted my major. And I was, again, I was at the end of the New Testament degree. I was about ready to write my thesis because I was in the master's program, not the MDiv. Uh, and I shifted gear to the, to the Old Testament. And it's all been Old Testament ever since then, because then I fell in love with the language. And it was, it was literally then all about the word and, and the Old Testament. And so uh, my journey as a student at Gordon Conwell was really important. And you know, just kind of to think that one Hebrew class was a game changer. It's kind of amazing. You know, I'm sure you all have experienced that too in your lives where you've done different things. And, you know, the Lord has just, uh, uh, it just set you on a different kind of a path. So that's what happened to me. Uh, I loved the language. I fell in love uh, with the Old Testament. And then I went on from there together with Tom, because then what happened with Tom was he actually got, we ended up both getting dual degrees. He got a church history degree, and then he ended up getting a degree in Old Testament. And th that was when it was fashionable to do dual degrees. And it still kind of is uh, to do so. But then I ended up doing an Old Testament degree at Gordon Connell and a, and a biblical languages degree. So I ended up with two degrees as well. Uh, and the idea was to go back to youth with a mission, to go back to be on the mission field. Uh, but that was not meant to be. Uh, we were involved with youth with a mission for eight years in various capacities. I was a part of a, we were both a part of um of a Bible training program. Has anybody heard of, well, besides Ryan, has anybody else heard of Youth with a Mission? So, so you have Christine and it's, it's, a, it's a mission. It's one of the biggest mission organizations uh, that is there. It's, it's, it's really services, short-term missions. Uh, and so that is where I thought I was gonna go back and serve after we got our master's degrees. But as it turned out, the Lord was calling us to do doctoral studies. And uh, it was very hard for me to realize that I wasn't going to go back to youth with a mission and teach in that Bible school that I was a part of uh, for, for eight years. But nonetheless, the, the Lord brought us to then the University of Toronto together, and we both ended up studying Old Testament. And my, our journey, I'm sharing this journey with you because it's first of all been a journey 
with the scriptures. And it's also been a journey together as a husband and wife team. Um, and it's also just been a journey of faith, just watching the Lord lead us and provide for us every step of the way. Because to think of two people doing a doctoral program at the University of Toronto, off coming off of a missionary field experience was kind of crazy. Like, I mean, think about it. We were living on missionary support and we felt like the Lord was asking us to move on to do doctoral studies. Uh, and so it was a huge leap of faith for us. But in so in taking that leap of faith, the Lord was unbelievable in provision for us um, as it turned out. So, so we ended up doing doctoral studies at the University of Toronto. And um, I specialized, I continued to specialize, of course, in Old Testament, where Hebrew language and literature was my was my was my specialty. And the two areas that I have, I think I wanted to share with you about that I have passion for really is, is the scriptures and the character of the scriptures. I was discipled by the word. Do you know what I mean by that? Like there are a lot of good books out there that disciple us and, and train us self-help books that are really wonderful. But I was trained in the scriptures. I sat with the scriptures in a nine month long Bible school and it was in youth with a mission and it was a game changer for me. And I fell in love with the character of the scripture. And I just wanted to continue to disciple myself in it, which is which is what led me really into then the higher education so that I could have more tools in my toolbox to properly educate people and bring them closer to being discipled in the word of God as well. So, so the scriptures for me have mattered so much because of how I've been shaped and transformed by them. And, and the character of the scriptures um, is as important to me, as well as the other thing that really I'm passionate about is the, the character of God that is revealed in the scriptures, but particularly the Old Testament. I think, um, you know, no matter what course I teach, it usually comes up, this whole idea, especially in the Old Testament, about the character of God. You know, is he just this angry deity kind of shaking his finger at any would-be transgressor? And so I feel my passion in my call is to really disciple people about the character of God through the Old Testament and also pan biblically just to show people that from Genesis to Revelation, God is a God who's gracious and merciful and he's slow to anger and he's abounding in steadfast love. Uh, but he will by no means clear the guilty. So I feel these two, these two things are my are my passion. It's what drives what I do at the seminary. Whatever class I'm teaching, whether it's biblical Hebrew, whether it's an exegesis class, so say an Exodus or a, a survey class, uh, I'm very very purposeful in in really championing the scriptures and 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 showing people how we need to continue with the scriptures that we need to let the scriptures mentor us like 2 Timothy 3 talks about, and I'm very passionate about uh, discipling people in the character of God, particularly through the Old Testament. And so there's probably not one class that you can take with me where I don't weave these two things that I'm passionate about into what I do. Um, it's kind of easy to teach the Old Testament, right, and talk about the character of God. But when you're in the book of Exodus, and we're talking about the hardening of heart, that Pharaoh uh, goes through some of it, his own doing and other passages that says God hardened his heart, you know, we're get you get really to the core of the matter, you know, and anyway, so those are some things that um, make me tick and are my passions, as it were, as I hear, as I instruct here at Gordon Connell. So it's, it's a privilege for me to be here. I love what I do. I don't want to be anywhere else. I love our students. In fact, I just, we just, we're just about finishing our semester. And uh, it's sad for me because I have such great interaction with the students in my classes, and I feel it's a wonderful opportunity to make relationships. And some of the relationships that I've had with students have been lifetime. You know, I go to their weddings or I have performed weddings for them. I'm also ordained um, in the four C's. And so um, anyway, I have that ability to, to stay in contact with students. So so for me, then the classroom is the place um, where the Lord has used me to use my gifts and uh, for the kingdom. And I love Gordon Conwell because it continues just to have that very strong focus on the scriptures and particularly the languages. So I get to do now at Gordon Conwell what I was attracted to come to Gordon Conwell to do as a student myself. So it's a privilege. It's just an honor. So that's a little bit about me. Perfect. Okay, so uh, this gives us 40 minutes. 
for Q and A time. Sorry uh, if you're hearing my children. Um, this is uh, the way we do this. Is um, I'm going to just mediate the um, the discussion here. So if you have a question that you would like to ask Dr. Petter, um, send it uh, via message to me, and then I can kind of uh, keep those queued up, and that way there's no danger of talking over each other or anything like that. Um, so I'm going to start with some of the questions that were submitted uh, via our online form. Um, and the first one uh, is super, super duper specific. Uh, I love this question. Um, so Dr. Petter, uh, the question is, in your commentary on Ezekiel, what were some of the things that you found interesting um, uh, or uh, discoveries that you made over and above your work on your dissertation? And how would you encourage a student who's interested in pursuing the OT deeper after uh, doing master's studies? And how is knowing biblical Hebrew, uh, how has that opened up the study of the Old Testament? Okay. Well, okay. I can't keep all this. So the very first, are they all questions? That so This is one, one oh. submission, uh, all lots of like boom, 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 boom. So, Love it. Okay. Can you start part yeah. one of it? Okay. So your, uh, your commentary on Ezekiel. Yeah. Were there any sort of discoveries that you made over and above uh, your dissertation work? Yes. Um, and maybe you could elaborate a little bit on that. Okay. Can we start uh, there? Can yeah, we start? We'll start yeah. There. So, so my dissertation work on Ezekiel was fantastic because it, it really did get me into this whole concept of divine abandonment and this idea of mourning, especially this theme of mourning. But what I was able to do in the commentary that I couldn't do in my dissertation is tie things to the New Testament, of course, right? Because it was an Old Testament degree, uh, but, but then take it, take this theme of lament and build it why God was after them to lament to begin with. And that's where in my commentary, I've taken a complete I've been able to let loose, if you will, you know, on what I really wanted to say is that this whole theme of lamenting is there to show that God wanted a heart transformation in his people, even though the fall of Jerusalem was inevitable because of the scroll, you know, that contained lamentation, mourning and woe. And because Jerusalem's decree was decreed in 586, no matter what, uh, that could not be changed. God wanted changed hearts and so a lament a, a lament attitude a lamenting attitude would show that they were actually sorry for their sins that there would be remorse for what they had done and and so that was where i was able to go beyond my dissertation and and take ezekiel uh and so i focused on that actually very strongly this whole theme of guilt and lament and how when you're defining guilt, what guilt really is, according to Ezekiel, and how then the lament theme is there for pastoral purpose. So I was able to bring out the pastoral piece as well in, in my commentary in little sections, which, by the way, I, I, it's, it's, I'm in the final stages of edit, editing this, partic this one particular commentary. So that's the part of the first question. I think I got it. You did. Um... And then how would you encourage a student interested in pursuing OT studies beyond the master's level? How would I encourage uh, to go into Old Testament studies, do you mean? Yeah, someone that's on a trajectory beyond the uh, master's level studies. So kind of how to navigate going to that place of doctoral studies. Oh yeah, so, so one of the things, that's a great question, by the way, that first question was a great question too, which we could stay on all night if, if, if we just had no you know, other questions to answer. Um, but this one is, I think you have to have, and anybody will tell you this, you really do have to have a clear strategy. And so that's obviously why the question is being asked. But the, the strategy is kind of, it would look something like this. Getting one degree in say the masters in Old Testament is really not enough. Uh, for someone who's interested in pursuing doctoral studies in Old Testament. Here, 
you, that's just, it doesn't show enough breadth on your transcript for someone who's, who's wanting and feeling called to do doctoral studies. So the general rule of thumb I like to tell people is to think of a dual degree and, you know, maybe a master's of art in Old Testament or, or biblical languages, but something that's going to show, and usually those are the two combinations that work really well is an MAOT and an MA in biblical languages, because what it does, it shows you it shows who the schools that you might be applying uh, to that you have a breadth beyond just the Hebrew that you have done other languages as well. So that would be Aramaic. It could be Ugaritic. It could be Akkadian. Um, it could be Septuagint Greek, a whole host of other things. So, so definitely a dual degree. And I would also say this, that you would, you should have um, avail yourself of the opportunity to actually write a thesis in the MA process, because that gives you a really good feel for what it might be like to do a dissertation. It's, it's I don't want to say a trial run, but in many ways it kind of is. Like I, I did write a master's thesis when I was at Gordon-Conwell um, and I actually did it on one of my passions, which is Exodus 34 verses six through seven, the character of God that, um, that Yahweh revealed to Moses at, at the golden calf. And so, um, so writing a master's thesis just really kind of gets the, the engine going as it relates to research and kind of what you would be in for when you would be taking a topic in a more concentrated way in a doctoral program. So that, so, so double degree, double degree, writing a master's thesis, and then uh, making really good contact with with not just schools, but with people with whom you'd really like to work. So you read their books and you go, oh, I love E.J. Revel. Now, E.J. Revel was somebody who trained me at University of Toronto and he was a technician with the language and he knew everything about the minutia of Hebrew. And so, you know, or maybe you wanna, so you, if you, you find people that, you've been mentored by their work that you like the work. And then you find out, of course, where, what school they're attached to. And then I would apply to those schools based on that. Uh, I'm not into name recognition. And so, you know, for example, Tom and I, as I told you, we got our master's degrees here at Gordon Conwell and we had the beauty of taking, this is why I love coming to new England is because we have the BTI, the Boston Theological Institute. And so we could take courses at Harvard. We could take courses at the you know, Boston University. And so it was wonderful because our transcript then was filled with other classes besides Gordon Conwell. And so the, the, um, the point is that, you know, you get exposure to the, to the broader, to, to schools broader than where you get your MA. Um, and so that is a big a, a really a big help along the way um, to do that. So double degree and then knowing people that you would want to work with is more important than, than name recognition. And so my point was Tom and I, even though we took classes at Harvard and at BU, you know, I was not enamored with Harvard because of its name. In fact, I did, there, there were people there, there was probably only one person that I had interest in working with, but then she transferred uh, to another school. And so I did not apply to Harvard just because I was here in the New England area. Um, you know, I had a good record, you know, not, and just because I had a good record in terms of a good standing with grades doesn't, it didn't mean that I was gonna get into Harvard, but I didn't even put my name in the Harvard pile. Because again, you don't want to get bogged down with name recognition. You want to go to a place where there's people that you like that you're going to work with. And that's really critical. You have to have a supervisor that you, you, you want to work with and that you can mix well with that individual. And, and so then the other piece is, is going to a conference, you know, uh, conferences such as the Society of Biblical Literature Conference, where you meet people, you meet these scholars who have written books who are going, you know, who teach at various schools, and then a face is met, you know, you introduce yourself, they meet you, you tell them what you're interested in studying, and that also helps part of, that helps along, that helps the process for sure. So those are the, some of the things that I actively did too. Uh, I knew that I was very interested in the University of Toronto, and one of the professors there was coming to New England to do a conference, and we met him here in Boston. And that was actually very providential because that meeting there showed him 
uh, a lot about us and vice versa. And so we were, we actually got into the University of Toronto uh, based on that meeting. He told us after the fact. So those are some, th- those are really important. I don't know if they're tips, but those are strategies, you know, that you could take if you're going down that field. Is that what you're sort of after in the question? I hope, I hope. it's very important yeah, to have a I good that, strategy. That was, a, that was one of the most comprehensive answers I've, I've heard on um, prep work for doctoral studies. So that's great. Okay, good. Uh, with the only clarification is that we do- doubling up on MAs is a little trickier because of mm. our shift in degrees, um, but not impossible, particularly with the way the MDiv interacts with MAs. Um, um, but that's uh, that's on the side. Um, okay. Um, Here's a great question for you is, are there prerequisites to starting Hebrew studies at Gordon-Conwell? Great question. Zip, zero, none. You start in on the same playing field as everybody else, right? Hebrew one is Hebrew one. Hebrew one, it's like literally Hebrew one is Hebrew one for everybody. So no, there are none. Now, here's what does happen, though, is people look like I did when I looked at the alphabet and thought, oh, 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 I don't think I can do this. They, they want to give themselves a head start. So everybody typically tries to get ahead by getting the textbook in advance and starting the, you know, the material in advance. And many times I'll have emails uh, to the effect of how can I get ahead? And so, um, so people want to do that just to take the, 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 the stress off of learning the alphabet and the vowels in a short time when the semester begins. But no, absolutely, absolutely not. Not, not even knowing modern Hebrew is going to help you. I have had, I've had people come you know, into learning biblical Hebrew from modern Hebrew, and they're thinking that that will help them in the process, um, but it actually doesn't uh, because it's a, it's a different animal. There's a whole different vocabulary. The, the, the script is different. And so there is not even knowing modern Hebrew gives you the, an advantage. There are no prerequisites then in short uh, for you taking biblical Hebrew. You step right on in and you're just like, okay, everybody's on the same playing field. And, and, right. And even if you've had, so the, the thing is, even if you've had another language, the common, the common um, denominator in that is, a, is knowing the rigors of how to study a language, but the language is completely different. And so that's why everybody is l- literally on the same playing field. So you might've had the advantage of studying Greek and then figuring out how to handle Greek vocabulary, or maybe you studied Spanish or whatever language you might have. Um, that certainly is an advantage going into studying Hebrew because uh, you will have like a rhythm from those previous language learning courses that you can take into learning Hebrew. But still, nonetheless, you know, learning Hebrew, you're, you're just starting on the same playing field as everybody else. Um, and so there, there are no, no prerequisites. That's great. Great news. Yeah, it is good news. Um, so. I get, we have had a couple questions that are similar, so I'll kind of weave them all together. And that is um, what sort of insight um, does the study of, of biblical Hebrew give to people um, in terms of how they look at the old Testament that, you know, the average lay person in a church wouldn't have. Boy. So this is this makes me whoever asking great questions. I in fact this is sort of what I do every week in class. Why does Hebrew matter? Why should I bother spending all this money? Right? Why should I bother uh, spending all this time to learn vocabulary in you know one two year two years uh, when there are and I'm not I don't mean to add to the question, but I think that's probably you know part of it. Why is it significant that I do it? So the payoff is awesome. I wish you could read some of my student evals and just hear some of my students who actually finished the course just recently. I just had this most wonderful email this morning. And this is like fresh off the press because we just, the end of Hebrew 2, you have the ability to translate a narrative text with the help of a dictionary. 
And so Genesis 22 is a beautiful, so that's a great accomplishment at the end of first year Hebrew. So you're taking Genesis 22 and you know a lot of the vocabulary uh, because of having studied the full year, but then you need the dictionary to help you with some oddball vocabulary. That's a major accomplishment, but but here is the payoff. And so the, the point is the student sent me, I just got this email today, I was so blessed, um, is that he was immediately preaching to his congregation in Romania based on the Hebrew, just a little Hebrew that he said he learned in first year about the significance of the word to see. So for example, uh, in, in Hebrew, there is the word ra'ah, which means to see. And that's repeated several times in Genesis 22. Our English translations use the word provide. And so you know the verse, I'm sure it's very familiar to you. Uh, whenever sweet Isaac, the only time he speaks in Genesis 22, he says, but where is the lamb for the burnt offering? I'm sure you're familiar with that passage whenever Abram is tested and God asks him to, to sacrifice his only son. And then Abraham's response is, God will see to it, my son. And that's where we hear and have the translation, Yahweh, Yireh, the Lord will provide. Now, provide is a fine idiomatic way of translating the Hebrew verb to see, which is ra'ah. But the whole point is missed if you use the translation provide. Because there are about five different times where the verb raw is used in Genesis 22. And so the idea is that God sees, he shows up and sees and provides a substitutionary sacrifice. And so the place of that sacrifice is called the Lord sees as well. So you miss that nuance if you don't know the language. And you just go with the typical translation provide. Interestingly enough, I this was really fun. The message, which is Eugene Peterson's wonderful everyday kind of translation, you know, and he and he takes it from the Hebrew, but he's what you know, it was it's it's a wonderful translation, but on those verses in Genesis 22, uh, he actually nails it in, in a positive way, close to closer to the Hebrew than some of the other versions. So the so so the payoff. In short, is that there is vocabulary and the way it's translated in English translations that just does not show what the Hebrew is is showing us. And so our student, my student today, uh, again, he's from Romania, and he said he preached on this right away, and he was showing his congregation how seeing is important in Genesis twenty two, just from his study of of Genesis twenty two. I mean, I could go on and on. Um, the flow of a passage uh, is 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 recognized in biblical hebrew um it but through the use of certain features in the language that does doesn't come out in english you know so for example in exodus and exodus is a great place um there's background information that is supplied in a narrative and that background information is very important to the storyline but in biblical Hebrew, that background information is communicated in a certain way. And you just need to know how that's communicated, right? Uh, and, and to show your audience, hey, this is background information, and yet you can still follow the key storyline through certain verbal forms. And all of that is just missed in translation. So it's, it's, it's kind of like the insights that you can give your congregation. It's kind of like the mood. I, I like to think of it as a movie, kind of seeing it in black and white versus color. You know, I love black and white movies. Oh, they're fun, but you get you get a, a deeper look at it whenever you you see it through the through the language. I always use the languages for preaching and teaching. I'm getting ready to preach on Mother's Day, and I'm just oh my gosh, I'm just so excited about the Hebrew because I'm talking about Isaiah 49. You know that wonderful passage in Isaiah 49 where uh, it talks about here. I should know it because I'm about to preach on it, but uh, where it says. Uh, can a woman forget her nursing child that she should have no compassion on the son of her womb, even though these may forget yet I will not forget you. And so, so and right above that, God says that he will have compassion on them. And so the, the word compassion is, is it, it actually derives from the word womb and it's actually showing affection that God has for his 
people and it's his affection that he has for his people that's going to cause him to bring salvation and restore them. So yeah, he's mighty to save and he can save and he's better than all the other deities are out there. But why does he bother to save? Because he has affection and connection and an intimate relationship with his people. And that's communicated through the word compassion. I will have compassion on my people. I will restore their fortunes. So, oh my goodness. So, so in terms of insights, they're, 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 this is why I do what I do. You know, so it's, it's very, the, the payoff is great. In fact, Tom, uh, my husband, who is, so he was with me as a professor here at Gordon Connell. We both got hired as professors, but now he's part-time at the seminary as a professor and as a full-time pastor. And we talk about this all the time. He said, McDonough, I am so thankful for my training in the languages. I am so thankful, you know, that I can look at the Greek and the Hebrew and, and just be able to get the exegetical ideas out there and enrich people. And, and you know, people walk away if, and they know when they've had a gourmet, meal, a gourmet meal or leftovers or fast food. And I'm telling you, knowing the languages, you're giving people a gourmet meal. You don't tell them. You don't tell them, hey, I went to the grocery store and this cost me this much and this, you know, this, you know, but they taste the meal and they go, whoa, that was good. And that's because of all the, you know, the behind the scenes work and the languages. I think that really does make for uh, a wonderful presentation of the scriptures, you know, without standing up and saying, well, the Hebrew says, you know, you can show them these things in, in a wonderful way that makes people go, wow. I want to know the word. I want to go to the word myself and see these things. That's great. Um, Sorry, you're getting me on a topic. I mean, I could just you no, have to was, stop was, me. I, I was, as you were talking, I was remembering one of the best books. I was, it's a really, uh, nobody that hasn't, nobody that uh, outside the seminary bubble uh, gets it. But one of the best books I read in seminary was Adele Berlin's, um, uh, what is it? Uh, Elements of Hebrew Pal Parallelism, which yeah. is an impossible book to read otherwise, but um, it completely transformed the way I look at, at uh, Hebrew poetry. So, um, and there you go. Tom was the one that made me read that thing. There you go. That um, thing. Okay. Yeah. Um, so, what uh, while we're talking about benefits of, of Hebrew, what are some some challenges? that arise when we are trying to figure out this language, um, coming to it with, uh, you know, a, an American English or, or, you know, um, uh, other perspective in terms of our language. So it's hard to put aside, obviously our language and also kind of our preconceived ideas in the words that we use to convey language. So I think one of the, I think one of the biggest obstacles that I find with my students is, is people are, are more inclined that, that we don't kind of let the Hebrew say what the Hebrew says. We're trying to kind of fit the Hebrew into our language. And I, I continually have to say people to say to people, nope, Let's, let's let the Hebrew say what it says. It's repetitive. It's out of order from the way that we typically say things. Uh, it emphasizes things in a way that we don't. And so let's try then to, to, to allow the Hebrew to be Hebrew and, and not impose our language on it. I think that's probably the biggest challenge. Um, that we face when we're just learning the language. And then we, you know, we've got a text in front of us and, you know, Hebrew is known to have a certain word order, right? And that is the verb comes first and then the subject and the object. So in, usually in English, uh, and, and this of course is what I'm most familiar with. So English is my mother tongue. So the subject comes first and not the verb, and it's a subject, verb, object uh, order. And so that really messes with people too, uh, the word order of our own mother tongue as well. So, so there definitely are challenges, but I think, the main, I think the main thing is just say, okay, this is not 
Korean. This is not English. This is not German. This is Hebrew. And then we got to learn the new learn Hebrew for the sake of Hebrew. And that's why too, I also try to have students do very wooden translations. So that way we, we always try to smooth it out to a good English read in a good English translation. I'm like, no, don't do that because we then are missing the structures of the language that are carrying meaning that we would miss otherwise. So I think, I think that would probably be one of the, the main challenges that we face with the language. Among the other things, like I think like we're not patient, right? And so he, learning Greek or Hebrew uh, causes you to slow down and it causes you to really think about what you're doing. So if you've learned any other language, you know that because you, you got to learn vocabulary, but especially with like the biblical languages, you really are forced to slow down and we're not used to slowing down. We want it like we want to learn it yesterday. Like, I, oh gosh, I want to have the, that vocabulary mastered so I don't have to keep flipping in my dictionary, right? And so we, we tend not to be patient with ourselves in the learning process. And that's, so I guess that would be the second thing is, is, is really allowing time. And uh, in an MDiv program, there's not a lot of time. And, and, we, and we, we do sometimes need to sit a little longer and so some people need longer on mastering vocabulary for the week than others. Some people need longer in learning grammar than others and, and, and learn to kind of balance what your learning style is, is important as, as well, I think too. Sweet. Um, well, so we've kind of danced around it. So I'll just ask the question, is there, you know, if there's not, um, no prerequisites or anything like that. Are there any um, are there any particular books that you would say are worth investing in or spending some time reflecting on before uh, students come into your classroom? Particularly for biblical Hebrew. Mm -hmm. uh, you know there no. I'm gonna be just honest. No, because. Uh, that I mean, there are books on you know Hebrew for the rest of us, Greek for the rest of us, um, that are actually good, and I would recommend them, but not at the entry point. I, I think that kind of honestly, I think, I mean, you could read a dictionary article about the history of the Hebrew language to kind of situate a part, you know, to situate yourself. Okay, you know. Where is Hebrew in this world of language of the Northwest Semitic family of languages? But even then, I, I don't think that is very helpful. I think I, I, it kind of colors a person because to think, oh, you know, it might be harder, it might be easier. I just think you go in and, you know, if you really, 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 really want to get ahead, then get ahead with the grammar that is assigned for the class and kind of go that way about it. Uh, but I, I don't, I don't, I don't really recommend that. And I don't feel the need. For students to do that because the task is already overwhelming to do it um and so i guess you could just read the, the grammar in advance if you really really want it but those books that tell you about hebrew that kind of give you the mechanics about hebrew are also dancing around the issue and you're not really learning hebrew um, so that's that's sort of how i you know right well, that's great um yeah dr pratico used to tell us to cross out sections of the book because they weren't the way that he wanted to, them to have been written um, oh yeah oh yeah you know someone in my class did that and whenever dr Pratico, oh he'd say ignore that section and then this one guy he got his big black marker and he was so dramatic in class he just went because there's already so many things we had to learn and so whenever the professor said oh you don't have to worry about that section I mean, he just literally put a big black X through it and was very dramatic about it. It was so funny. So, but now that he's written his own grammar, it's good. Right, right. Um, okay, so here's a question. I don't think this person's uh, with us presently, but I think it's a great question. Uh, there's a couple um, questions that I think nail to kind of um, Gordon Conwell's compass on uh, historicity of the Old Testament. So one would be how how do we approach um, the person of Moses 
um, being a historical, an actual historical figure or um, um, more of a, a fictional character. Mm. Oh, yeah. So you, you got to read the our statement, our mission statement. Uh, you know, can I say a lot of times students don't even know that that statement exists. And it's in some classes that I teach. So sometimes I'll teach, you know, interpreting the Old Testament or, you know, it just depends on the class. But I refer people to our, uh, what, what, um, the commentary that we have online about our statements of faith, our articles of faith. And in the commentary, this is why I'm referring to it, it talks about these issues of our historical orthodoxy uh, about the scriptures and about the whole talk, you know, justification, authorship, etc. And so we we are, although we're multi-denominational, you know, we have a historical orthodoxy about the scriptures. Um, and so I would encourage you, if you're not sure about, you know, what where Gordon Connell stands, to read our documents. Uh, those documents have been revised, but but especially, you know, the issues of authorship of the Pentateuch. Um, they are clearly articulated that we hold to the historic orthodoxy of the scriptures uh, in the tradition of the Reformation. Um, and that, you know, obviously in certain classes, discussions of Moses and Adam as historical or historical figures takes place. You know, there's books to read and whatnot. Um, but in terms of the school, uh, that's our views on the Holy Spirit, our views on the scriptures, our views on conduct, right? Our, our, it, it's, it's in print there for people to see in advance. Did, did, Brian, do you know the, 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 the text I'm talking about? Yeah, so Jordan okay. actually dropped a link to it in the chat. If you guys are curious and would like to, to take a look at, at what those Oh, great. Are. I'm not looking at the chat because I, I can't do two things at once. That's okay. That's why we're here. <laughs> but I find those documents really good. So because then that way, you know, you know, going in that, oh, yeah, we're going to have discussions about it. Um, but we're going to continue to hold uh, to the view that Moses wrote most of the Pentateuch uh, and for you know a host of reasons, uh, but we're going to continue to hold to that to, to those views, along with several other topics that could could be raised as well. Good questions to, to think about. Yeah. OK, so uh, and then a second question um, aside is is how do. Um, how do we uh, size up the character of God um, with the conquest narratives and sort of the, the violent uh, repossession of the land that God instructs the people to, to go about doing? So you do that by reading the whole Old Testament. And you honestly, I'm telling you, so you, under, you understand those texts in light of the broader picture of the Old Testament. Because if not, you're proof texting. It's the same way, right? You know, to highlight the hardening of, of Pharaoh's heart by God and to not pull that text out, uh, to pull uh, the extermination of the king. It's the same thing, right? It's, it's the same, we're, we're, we're messing and we're, un we're trying to, not messing, but we're trying to understand the justice of God. And my, my final firm answer to something like that is start in Exodus 34 verses six through seven, where God said he, especially actually 33, where he says he will be merciful to whom he will be merciful. I will have compassion on whom I will have compassion and I will be merciful on whom I will be merciful. And then he reveals his character to Moses in Exodus 34 verses six through seven as a God who is gracious and merciful to slow, slow to anger. Uh, abounding in you know covenantal loyalty, but he will by no means clear the guilty. And I think if we start there with an understanding of the character of God, that he there's two sides to the coin, that he's compassionate and merciful and gracious, but he also deals with guilty people, it's going to help us understand the trajectory of the narrative and how he deals not just with his covenantal people, but those outside of the covenant as well. And that is where I would start the discussion and say, you're on a journey of discovery and there's not an easy answer. I mean, there are answers that we could say, you know, one, two, three, four, he did it for this reason. 
But those are just short term, kind of just not fully scratching the itch. It's just putting a Band-Aid, I think, on the problem. And that is really understanding the larger narrative of how God acts and reacts with his people and with the covenantal people, with, with the people who are not in covenant relationship with him. So stay tuned and read the Old Testament. Love it. Uh, okay. Um, and we are, we only have four minutes left, uh, three minutes left by the count, by the schedule here. We just burned through this time, but uh, so this, this question I realize um, could easily take us well into the next hour, but I wonder if you could uh, succinctly kind of just uh, weigh in on whether or not um, study in the Old Testament um, has anything to contribute to the discussion of women in leadership when we talk about um, Paul's writings and the, all the conversations going on as to whether or not women should be in positions of authority uh, over men or in church positions? Really? You're asking this now with <laughs> three minutes to go? <laughs> and you're asking me, a female in the Old Testament, specializing in the Old Testament. Brian, come on. Um, I'm, just, so, I'm just relaying the questions. You're just relaying the questions. Yeah, yeah. So, so wow. So, what is the question? Just tell me the question again, just to kind of, so I could quickly just make a statement. Um, this, the question is, um, is in relation to the writings of Paul, is, is there anything that Hebrew Bible study um, can contribute to the idea okay. of whether okay. or not women should be in leadership yeah. or ordained? So, no, I think, I think, no, I think, because when you read the Old Testament, I mean, it's, I mean, there's, there's, You've got women that are doing things, but it's just a very, it's a whole different cultural context. And so I, I think we have to understand the old in light of the new. So in terms of our hermeneutical framework, um, we're going to get our greatest understanding from the Old Testament. I think we see glimmers of what God is doing through the Old Testament, but, but and he's kind of preparing for the breadth that we're going to see with the cross and what comes with the Holy spirit and the giving of gifts. Uh, but, uh, but again, again, it's that trajectory of the narrative, right? It's that we have to also see. Um, so, so no, I, I would not, in fact, I think that we have to understand that it's, you know, it's progressive uh, redemptive history is moving forward. And in that, in that we come to the Paul's letters and we come to how Jesus deals with women in the gospels. Um, and, and therefore we have to understand, you know, the new and light of the old and light of the new. So in that regard, we just have to kind of wait. So I don't, I fact, in fact, I think people often look at the old Testament and think it's a problem as it relates to women. And, and it's true. There's, there are a lot of issues, uh, but it's just a lot of sinful people, uh, doing sinful things and women are a part of that. And it's a part of, you know, redemptive history. So no, I think we got to wait until we get to the new Testament. Awesome. I mean, you did it. So uh, yeah. I mean, there you go. Um, okay, cool. Well, we're, we're um, to the end of the time here. Uh, Donna, if you could leave us with um, a final statement, uh, is there any last things that you'd like to, to leave this uh, webinar with? Yep. So, Continue with the scriptures, no matter if you come to Gordon Conwell, no matter where you go, you know, it's the, the charge that Paul gave to Timothy, continue in what you have learned and become convinced of, and that is the scriptures, because you know from whom you've learned it. So it's a charge to think about the character of the scriptures and to think about the character of the people that mentored us who knew the scriptures. And so that's my just word of encouragement is whether you select Gordon Conwell or not, whatever lies ahead for your path in life, don't quit on the scriptures. Yeah, you can have questions, but don't quit on the scriptures because that's the scriptures mentor us. The scriptures mentor us. And you know what? I'm reading a book now. Oh my goodness. It's showing how American Christianity 
has quit on the scriptures. I mean, that's is my own little language. I'm saying quit on the scriptures, but it's called um, the invisible bestseller. Uh, you know, in this in it, it's, a, it's a wonderful book because it's projecting how yeah we go and we buy Bibles for birthdays, Bibles for anniversaries. You know, we buy Bibles for firefighters and Bibles for dancers. They're on our shelves four or five of them in American households, but no one reads them anymore. Uh, you know, through the, up into through the 60s, people were relying on the scriptures to kind of, you know, give us character in our life in American Christianity. But now, now, now the scriptures are invisible in our lives as Americans and as we're expressing American Christianity. So anyway, it's just feeding a lot of my own thinking. And so my passion is, continues just to continue. It's my word of encouragement as we leave is just to continue with the scriptures, to continue to be convinced of the scriptures and their power and how they mentor you in your life. Fantastic. Thank you so much. What's for being with us. And uh, thank you everybody who's joined. Um, stay tuned. We'll be back next month. Great. Nice to see you all. Oh, where's our brother from Claymore, Joshua. Hello. Are you still there? What time is it where you, I'm, I'd love to talk with you. It's so fun. You said yeah, I'm still, I'm, I'm still around. Yeah. So it's around uh, 2 a.m. Oh, and you joined the call. How impressive is that? <laughs> Yeah, so I, I was just waiting for the call. <laughs> wow. You know, I have to tell you that my husband and I served in Togo, West Africa. We lived in 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 in, West, in Togo for for nine months, and so we have such, even still to this day, we have such a a, a, a soft spot in our heart for West Africa. Wow, wow, well, that's encouraging. And we love yeah, it when our so African. Yeah, so basically, I'm, I'm more interested in Old Testament uh, studies uh, simply because I had time to look into some scholars, uh, African scholars who have written Old Testament uh, books, and I've just realized that they are few. So it's been something that I've been thinking of, like to pursue, so that at least uh, even Africa can have people who can be able to write something uh, concerning the big story of God. Mm. Yeah. Amen. Wow. It's very exciting to yeah. hear and to have you on the call. Oh my goodness. It's exciting to have everybody because you just, with the Zoom, isn't that wonderful? Like, like we, it, it really has been a disadvantage, but on the one hand, like to have a call like this and see people calling from Nepal and, Oh, it's just, just wonderful. We're praying for India, by the way. Oh my goodness. We are praying. We've had two prayer vigils at Gordon Conwell, um, you know, for India and, and, and the area. So anyway, I know you're from Nepal, but sorry, I just didn't mean to, I, I just, this is very exciting to see. I'm from Youth with a Mission. I have an international background, so it's very exciting to see people where they're calling from. All right, guys. Um, yeah, I think we'll 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 uh, leave it here. See okay. You next time.